known as Coach, and uh, two-time Hall of Famer. And uh, we are on part eight, and we're going to talk boxers right now. And uh, uh, so it's a really a great honor to have this opportunity to have J.D. tell us kind of his life story here. Um, he's in town for just a short minute here, and uh, he'll have to go. So um, let's make the most of it. Um, <clears throat> and he, uh, he's the one that started Wolfpack. So I'm going to go with some boxers here, and uh, uh, maybe you'll know some of these boxers too. Um, I'm going to start with Byron Mitchell. Tell us about him. Byron Mitchell came to me when he was 15 years old. And he had this big smile on his face and he says, I want a box. I said, do you really? He says, yes, I want a box. Big smile on his face. The very first day, I gloved him up and I put him in the ring with a fella that had been boxing previously. His name was Ray Barrett. Uh -huh. And Byron held his arm. The only thing uh, Byron would do, he would switch his feet from left to right, from left to right. That's the only thing that let me know he hadn't been properly trained to box. Uh -huh. But as far as throwing punches, uh -huh. he could do that because he, he, he fought for a time or two in the streets. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, eventually, Byron, uh, uh, he won his first three or four fights. And I remember when he came to me, I'd have all the kids, I have 22 kids, I'd have them get out and we do floor exercises where we do sit-ups and things of this nature. Uh -huh. And so I said, everybody down, everybody got out and Byron was still standing up. And I did my hands like, what? And he walked up to me, he says, coach, I don't need, I don't need uh, to do sit-ups. He lifted up his shirt, he said, I got it six pack <laughs> and he did he had a six pack and so i didn't disagree with him but he said something in my mind and and set something off and so what i said i gotta show him he needs to do some sit-ups mm -hmm. so there was a guy having a fight in birmingham alabama his name was mary hatchie he was an older coach mm -hmm. and i called mary hatchie up and i told mary i said i got this kid in excellent shape, but he told me he didn't need to do sit-ups. Do you know a good body puncher? And Mary Hatcher said, yeah, I, I got one. I said, well, find me a good body puncher to compete with my kid. Mm -hmm. And his name was Austin Thompson. Austin Thompson was from, I believe, some part of Tennessee, but I forget it. Ripley. He was from Ripley, Tennessee. Uh -huh. So Austin was one weight division uh, higher than Byron. Well, during the bout, before the bout, I went to Austin's coach. I said, you know, my boy ain't not doing sit-ups. And he said, he don't need to do sit-ups. And I know Austin is a good body puncher. If you can have Austin stairs by there, I appreciate it. I said, but now, I'm going to tell you, I taught Byron, if any time a person can hit you to the body, you can hit them to the head. And I said, Byron can cry. I said, you tell your boy to be careful, but he stay to the body. And I appreciate it. And so the fight started. And the first round, that boy was two Byron's body, but Byron was cracking him over the top. And I thought Byron was gonna knock him out. I was like, oh, this might just backfire. But mm -hmm. the boy stayed down to his body. And in the second round, he knocked Byron's breath out. Okay, that was on a Saturday. And he won the bout, he stopped the bout. Monday, we was back in the gym. I didn't even have to say everybody down. Byron's over there in the corner doing his setup, you see? And so now, on surface, it looks like I was a trader coach. I tried to hurt the kid, but going forward, I was building a champion. I didn't tell him. I did. I told him, but he didn't hear me. Did you need to do sit-ups, okay? He told me he didn't need to. Austin Thompson showed him he needed to do sit-ups. Mm -hmm. And after that, Byron, I don't think, ever got stopped with a body shot. Mm. Mm -hmm. And he became champion of the world. But Byron Mitchell, he had a wonderful, uh, he was a wonderful fellow, wonderful smile, and he was determined. The thing that was unique about Byron, unlike all my other boxers, I never, <clears throat> I never had to go pick Byron up to bring him to practice. Byron stayed on the other side of town, 
he'd walk to practice in the rain and everything else. Now, when he first started, I told him, I said, you can't fight in, out in the streets and, and do this. And I remember one time he got in a fight right. and I heard about it and I suspended it for two weeks. Byron would come almost every, every day of practice. He'd come and stay outside that gym, just look inside the gym. And some people in the gym say, that two weeks too long, man. JT, you all let him come on back in. And I let him come back in. And Byron had no more fights after that. And eventually he became champion of the world. Wow. Yeah, yeah but Byron Mitchell was determined. He was headstrong. And he, he could punch. He could hit with either hand. I mean, he had power with the left hook, right hand, uppercut, anything. He knocked people out with everything. Jabs, everything. Byron Mitchell. I knew when he was sparred, most of the time, with the exception of when he sparred this coach. Every time he, whoever get in front of him, I know he's gonna hurt him. Now, mm -hmm. now I already knew it. Anybody that even if Byron loses a fight in the amateurs or the pro, whoever fight Byron Mitchell, they're gonna get hurt. I knew that. Now, near the end of his career, that's when I I I I, I recognized that Byron wasn't hurting people that he was getting in the ring with. And of course, he had, he had had a, a lot of punishment up to that point, and he wasn't quite the same. He'd be what you call an uh, uh, aging fighter at that point. His mm -hmm. legs had started to go. I wanted to make sure I was with him during the end of his career. Wow. Because so many uh, people take advantage. You know, they put a kid that's up, up and coming in there with the older lion, and some of those referees, they, they know they want to please the crowd, and the crowd likes to see knockouts and stuff like that. And I don't want Byron to see too much damage. So I made sure I was with him the latter part of his career. Mm -hmm. After all the other people that, that, that the entourage and all them people was around him when he was on top, you know what I mean? They mm -hmm. done faded away, ain't nobody there, but I was there for him because mm -hmm. I started with him and I wanted to end with Byron. Mm -hmm. I love him today. I really do. Wow. Okay. So... Um, let me go. Now, how many years did you work with him? Oh, good God. Byron started around 82. I think it was. From 82, and I think he retired 2013, something like that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. And and how far did he go in the boxing syndrome there? He went, he went to champion. He's two-time WBA. That's, that's World Boxing Association. Uh-huh. Uh, Super lightweight champion of the world. Really? Yes. She was yeah. He is the only kid I trained from the beginning that became a world champion. Wow. Yes. Amazing. Okay. Uh, how, talk to me about um, Katakota. Bertha Katakota. He's from Cape Town, South Africa. He looked like a white boy with a tan. He's actually mixed. And Bertha Katakota, I got with him after he became champion, uh, he was World Boxing Network champion. Now that particular organization is now defunct, but it's a ranking committee. Uh -huh. We did five fights together. Virgil Catacota, I remember one fight he had against a kid from Columbia. I'm not sure exactly where we was fighting. I believe it was in Varna, uh, Bulgaria. I'm not certain, I don't remember exactly, but we was over in Europe somewhere and it was televised on Eurosport. And Virgil Catacota, after the first round, I think it was, Virgil said, Johnny, I'm sluggish. I just don't know what's happening. Well, the kid that he was fighting, he was about my complexion. He was Colombian, but he was a black Colombian. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what I know about politics and boxing and the people in general, everybody in the world wants a champion to look like them. And so it's not necessarily so much a racial thing in a sense. It's just that if the judge is all white, and they tend to pull for somebody to look closer to them. I know this. You know what I mean? That's who they're going to vote for. Well, I had the kid that looked closer to white, like a white boy with a tan. So I knew if Virgil stayed in the center of the ring, and he controlled the center of the ring, and just don't get knocked down or nothing, more likely we'll win the fight. So after the first round, when Virgil would throw a, throw a combination, this kid was faster than Virgil, and, and he just had speed on him, and he beat Virgil the combination. And Virgil knew it. Virgil come, came to the corner. I said, well, look, don't just all I want you to do, Virgil, is stay in the center of the ring and work your jab. Every now and then, throw, throw a right hand. Every now and then, throw a left hook. But just work your jab. Just stay in the center. And Virgil is such a wonderful athlete. He listens to everything his coaches say. All right, all right so after the, uh, near the end of the fight, I mean, it was close fight. And uh, uh, 
And they said, the winner and still uh, uh, champion, Virgil Catacota. When we got to the dressing room, Virgil looked at me. He was he was unwrapping us. Uh, I was taking his uh, hand wraps off. And he looked up at me. He said, Johnny, tell me, did I really win that fight? I said, yeah. You what? Won. You really won. <laughs> you raised your hand up, Virgil. You won. He said, no, 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 Johnny. But I mean, did I really win that fight? Virgil kind of knew that that kid was, was pretty good. But the thing is, he, he made a mistake. The kid did not fight for the control of the center of the ring. You, you got to understand this about boxing. The person that stays in the center, according to some judges, most judges, and see, I'm, I'm so fortunate because I've actually sat in on judging seminars and I know what judges look for. And and I, I had this fellow tell me a long time ago, his name was uh, Marvin Posey. He was a much older white gentleman. And I asked him what's the key to refer refereeing fights. He said, Johnny, you look at me. Hell, I'm old as hell. You can't just... I can't keep up with them fellas, how many punches they throw and land. Hell, they face is lightning. He said, I don't look for that there. I just watch that fella to stay in the center of the ring, and that's the one going to get in my boat. Oh, my there God. Go. So now, not only do we think that way, a lot of other uh, referees and judges, a lot of these guys are old and retired, and they think like that. So I had Virgil to stay in the center of the ring. I used to call that. I'm giving one of my secrets now. I, I'd yell out to my fighter, CC Golf. That means control the center of the ring and get off first. That means throw your punches first. If a fighter does that, most of the time he's going to win the fight. He doesn't necessarily have to be the best fighter or the best athlete. But if he does that, depending on the judges, and most judges, they, they like people to stay in the center and throw punches. Wow. Now, there are exceptions to that rule. Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, these guys could actually fight backing up and off the ropes and everything. But there are exceptions to the rule. They're not the rule. The rule will prevail seven, eight, nine times out of ten. The exception to the rule will prevail one, two, three times out of ten. So we play with the odds. So I had Virgil stay there in the center of the ring and work your jab. And we won that fight. And when they come to my corner and they interview me, I tell Virgil, I say, you be the governor. You're the governor, Virgil. You're the governor. And I got that from watching an English coach one time. I forget his name, but he, but he was telling this fighter, you're the governor. You're the governor. So I was telling wow. Virgil he was the governor. So the announcers and all, Virgil was standing in the center. Just like so, it, it it played out perfect, and we got the victory. Amazing! But I was with Virgil five fights; he won them all. And now Virgil is retired. I think he still has his ministry. He's moved from South Africa to Australia with Facebook friends, and he's got a beautiful family, and everything's fine. Virgil got a coat. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are going to close this one off at this point, and we'll be back real soon. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. And uh, this is part eight. So if you get a chance to see the others, please do. Um, and uh, I, I promise you, you'll enjoy it. Anyway, you have a great one. Thanks again for joining us. And love to you. And do something kind for a stranger. And we'll be back real soon.